Ah. Because <laughs> this is, in a sense, a follow-on, but it, it, it doesn't matter terribly. Um, in the in the, uh, in the opening theory, I argued, uh, perhaps slightly contentiously, about what we're doing in the classroom when it comes to reading with skimming, scanning, inferring kind of activities. Uh, and I suggested, for a variety of reasons, that um, although these activities have been under attack by a lot of people recently, uh, that these are valid activities in the classroom, but not particularly useful when it comes to developing students' reading. That the value of skimming and scanning activities is unconnected with the development of reading skills. And I concluded by uh, suggesting that in order to develop students' reading skills, we have to get our students reading. And that means extensively, not reading shortish 200, 250, 300 word texts from course books. That is simply not enough, and it's the wrong kind of reading anyway. So that's the sort of background, um, and the uh, the article, the written version of that presentation, is, I think, already up on the, the website. For this uh, presentation, which is partly, I'm going to get you to do something at some point, if you don't mind too much. Um, this has not been written up yet. I haven't actually written an article on this topic. But I will be doing so very soon, uh, because uh, TESOL Spain have asked me to do an article on this. And I have to do it by the end of next week, um, which puts a certain amount of pressure on me. And as soon as I have written it, then I will put it up on the CETA platform, yeah? or, or possibly even on the TESOL Mastelli Space platform. So if you don't feel like taking notes, um, you don't have to, really. And the, the key information, really the key information, are the websites which are on the handout. Which you should, everyone got a copy of this, this handout? My glamorous assistant. <laughs> so I'm interested in, in the business of developing students' reading skills through basically getting them to read extensively and read as much as possible. And my, my end target, if you like, is to have students who will read of their own volition, who will be autonomous readers, who will want to read. That, after all, must be what we're aiming to achieve. I'm, I'm not a dreamer, I am a realist, and I know that we are unlikely ever to achieve that with all students in any one class. However, the situation in most school and college situations that I come across is that only a tiny number of students actually end up reading of their own volition. Um, five, ten percent, maybe. So I would consider now uh, that if in any particular class a teacher can get even up to 50% of the students reading English on a regular basis, that's a major success. But I would like to underline the fact that this is not something which you will achieve overnight. This must be a part of a program which is long term. And it does make sense to implement programs of this kind with uh, other colleagues in the places that you work. Because one of the tragedies in most contexts is that we have uh, students for a year and then they get somebody else who does something completely different afterwards. Um, so if you like the sorts of things that I'm suggesting, this, there's nothing complicated, nothing expensive here. Um, it's free, right? If you like these ideas, then it would make sense to talk with colleagues and see if they're interested as well. There's nothing complicated about it. This must be a long-term project looking with children um, over a period of a minimum one year uh, and I would not expect to have much success at the end of the first term. I would not expect to have as much success as I'd like at the end of the year, but over a period of a number of years, maybe I can have some success. Um, I don't have a solution, because I have partial solutions. We have some partial solutions already, which I'll refer to. Uh, this is almost all practical, and I'm going to be pretty much theory free, but I, I give a bit of uh, respectability with a quotation. And this seems to me uh, a quotation which sums up our problem very directly. In general, do I need to read it without me? Just read it.
And the sentence that I like most there is, um, students not reading and not liking to read is a problem. And it is a problem, and it's not just a problem for us, of course, because I, I, I was told, I don't know any Greek, I know just a few words, but I have no use. Uh, but I was told that the word in Greek uh, for read is the same as the word for study. And of course, reading and studying do go together. It's not the only way of studying, but reading is part of studying. And we know that good readers will perform well at school, not just in English, but in all subjects. The more they read, uh, the more they will read, and the more they will learn. So if you have students who don't read in their mother tongue, getting them to read in English is a tall order and may never happen. Well, it's a pity. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try as far as we possibly can. So the suggestion here is very simply, we've got to get our students to read. And Dame Bamford, uh, there are only a couple of published books actually on extensive reading. Um, <clears throat> And one of them is in the CUP series. Extensive reading should be an integral part of reading instruction in the second language classroom. An integral part. Now this happens far more often in uh, normal context. By normal I mean schools, not language schools. Language schools are rather different, and particularly when it comes to native speaker teachers, particularly those who've been trained with uh, Cambridge and Trinity qualifications. Because those qualifications are centrally concerned with performance, performing in a lesson. Yeah? about jumping through hoops, and it's whether you can perform in front of a class in 40 minutes or whatever it is. So in those courses, there isn't really any possibility to look at extensive reading, because it wouldn't feature as one lesson. So we need to get our students reading extensively. How do we do it? Well, the, the first question is, what do we want them to read? And uh, traditionally, the only real tool that we have available are the graded readers from all of the publishers. They all produce them. Now, graded readers are used in all sorts of places and for all sorts of reasons, but I don't think that graded readers are the solution. If I were learning Greek, I would have absolutely zero interest in reading some simplified version of a Greek novel. I don't really read fiction. It's just not my thing. I'm a compulsive reader, but fiction is not my thing. Most of you probably do read fiction from time to time. Well, then put up your hand if you read fiction in English in the last two months. That's slightly over 50%. They're not terribly impressive, is it? I mean, you know, if we don't do it, can we really expect our students to read it? And okay, uh, sorry. Could we possibly see Yes, we could do that if you like. So if you're a native speaker, uh, put your hand up first of all. And we just, just get a feel of where you are, and we're going to forget you now, you don't really count. <laughs> so for non-native speakers, put up your hand if you've read something in English in the last two months. Oh, yes, something in English. Uh, fiction. Uh, fiction. Yes. Fiction, I mean <laughs> fiction, not the Athens News or whatever. <laughs> fiction. That's mostly fiction. <laughs> And if you're a non-native speaker and you haven't read anything in the last few months, put up your hands. That's interesting. If you haven't, that's interesting. So the, the non-natives are actually reading more than the natives. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. But I don't think that readers are the solution. And I, they might be part of the solution for some of the people. But there are problems with readers. Uh, the first problem is expense. To buy a sufficient number of graded readers costs quite a lot of money. They aren't particularly cheap. Because if you have a class, and it depends on the context how big your classes are, in Belgium, you know, we're talking 27, 28 typically in class, it can go up to 30, uh, it can go up to 32 um, if the school is hard up and can't afford another teacher. So at the very minimum, you'd need 30 readers of appropriate levels, since no class that I've ever visited in my life is kind of the same ability, all classes are mixed ability, you need a variety of levels. And I mean, grade systems vary, but you need probably three different levels, so that's a hundred books minimum. Within those hundred books, um, there are going to be some which are dull. There's going to be some which are dull and nobody wants to read, and there are going to be some which people do want to read. So the ones that people do want to read will very quickly get battered, and dirty, and ugly, and need to be replaced. So there's an economic issue there too. The other issue, I think, concerns the nature of these readers. I have nothing against graded readers, per se, but most of them are fiction. Some of them are simplified versions of well-known novels, and some of them are written by people like me, um, pretending 
to be novelists, because I think lots of writers would really rather be novelists. When people ask me, what do you do? I say, I'm a writer, and they're impressed. And then I say, no, I write school books, and they go away. <laughs> In fact, there is a, have you heard of Philip Kerr? There's a, there's a Scottish novelist called Philip Kerr, and in some countries he's extremely well known. I pretend I'm him sometimes. <laughs> Until they ask me to pay bills, because he earns a little bit more than me. But, but fiction is part of the problem. What do your students want to read? Well, they tend to read what they read in mother tongue. And that is probably not going to be fiction very often. We need to know what they're going to read in their mother tongue. Now, the publishers will turn around and say, yeah, but it's not just fiction. We've got loads of things. We've got titles about football and fashion, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you took one level, let's say B1, how many books about football are there as graded readers? One, or maybe two. Yeah? And it might not be very good. So this simply isn't the range of material there. The other problem, I think, with graded readers is that they're books. And they're distributed by teachers in a school context. And so by definition, many students won't want to read them. Because they're books given to them by the teachers. It's school, it's tedious. And I see this with my own kids, and I see it in the classes that I go to. And adults too, for that matter. It's a chore. So reading books clearly isn't the solution for everybody, but it may be a partial solution for some. So I don't suggest you drop the graded readers if you're using them already. Far from it, continue using them, but be realistic. Things have changed recently because we have these things now. And we have internet connections, and most of our students do. So an alternative source of reading material is obviously online, the internet. Um, and from some of the research, if uh, you're interested, it's worth talking to Melani here and her colleague Karina because they know what students actually do and want, like. They like reading online. That's where they like getting their information. They don't even realize they're doing it. They don't realize they're doing it. And interestingly, in Romania, and it's exactly the same in Belgium, and I assume it's the same here, many, many people will already be using English as the language that they're reading online, mm -hmm. simply because there's so much more available in English than there is in Greek or Romanian or even French. I mean, French language where I live is, is obviously a big, big language with much more online, but English has so much more. And English, for better or for worse, is perceived to be a cool language. It is the language of Hollywood. It is the language of pop music and rock music. Um, even your Greek pop singers and rock singers, they'll be singing often in English, as our Belgian people do. So English is, is perceived as kind of cool and it's okay to read it. Uh, and we know that kids will do this. My younger daughter, who's 12, is, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit it, she's a monolingual French speaker. We speak French at home, and for various reasons, which I won't go into, um, she's remained monolingual, and she doesn't do it at school either. But my young daughter, Ella, uh, knows an incredible amount of English, some of it through me, when I'm saying things at her in English, but mostly from the stuff that she's doing online. So I think this online thing is, is something which we need to explore. Students will be doing it already, kids and adults. Uh, I, I feel that our job now is to encourage them to do more and to do it intelligently and with help. The problem with online reading, as we all know, is that it's very difficult to control the content. What exactly are they going to be reading? Um, and even if we put the sort of pornography and all that stuff to one side, there's an issue with language level. Because if you start trying to read English online uh, and you keep going to sites which are simply too hard for you, then you'll be quickly demotivated. And the point of all of this is motivation. It's to get them to want to do it themselves. So there are tools that we need, and there are two basic tools I'd like to suggest which we need to have ourselves so that we can tell our students about them. Um, the first is not Google. Google is not the right search engine to use, because Google will bring up any amount of information which is simply linguistically too high for them. Now, I'm focusing mostly on children, but I mean, I think this applies to young adults too. I can't always tell the difference between 